up here. But while we're trying to sort that out, I can introduce you to Mark Spencer, the creator of Asterisk and owner of Dixium. I think that's the name. Dixium. My name is Ole Johansson, and I'm one of the developers in Asterisk, specializing in SIP, but also one of those that get a living out of training people in Asterisk. And I have five days of slides on my laptop and we only have one hour. So I'm going to raise the board rate quite a lot here and work fast. But Mark and I are going to do this together. Uh, we haven't got a plan, so we jump into in the middle of a presentation and we'll take a bit of that and then see where it takes us, listen to your questions, either answering verbatim or finding another set of slides and go from there. So it's going to be very, very interactive. We're going to have two-way communication at least, if not to say a conference bridge in the, in the room. How many here listened to the last presentation by Mark about Asterisk? Okay, so I can safely assume that you know Asterisk. How many here knows a program in Linux called Make? Great. So, uh, you all heard of how wonderful Asterisk is, what you can do with it. You can get your Linux PC to talk, answer your phone calls, do exciting things, create scripts that integrate with SNMP or your MySQL database, check whether or not your kid is home by using Bluetooth presence like Mark does, uh, monitoring your girl's calls. I'm soon about to start doing that. My daughter is 12 and people are starting to call her all the time. So I really need asterisk. You need asterisk. So let's check what you need to consider before installation, before you hit make. When you size your actual server, there's a number of functions you have to consider. You can run asterisk on extremely small systems. I have a slide somewhere else on this laptop, on the smallest one I've seen. It's a gumsticks computer, smaller than a Red Bull can. Not powered by the Red Bull, though, even though the programmer was. But it actually hosted Asterisk being able to take multiple calls. You can install Asterisk on Linux routers, wireless routers, the ones that run Linux, and be able to handle a few calls on that machine. If you're setting up a service provider, you need to have bigger machines. And what you need to think about is, I would say the primary factor is the number of simultaneous calls you want your Asterisk server to be able to process. You can easily install Asterisk for home use on a Pentium 500 megahertz. You can handle the amount of calls you can handle in a normal family, unless you have 20 kids or more. But number of simultaneous calls is really important. Remember now that Asterisk is a TBX. We can handle strange TSPN calls coming in. At the same time, three to three voice calls and SIP calls and X calls. Each one having different properties in regards of codec and bandwidth use and call quality. In order to take in a call with one set of coding standards for audio and ship the audio out with another set of codec, we have to do something called transcoding. If you're setting up Asterisk to do that in a larger scenario, your CPU will be really hot. Transcoding, in addition to the number of simultaneous calls, eats your CPU. So if you have a highly compressed GSM codec call or speech coming in, and you want to send out a plain PSN call or an ICN card, your PC will have to transcode the audio. The third factor you have to consider is whether or not you want to run conference bridges. We have an excellent little application called Meet Me. You can take simultaneous, a high number of calls, connect them together so they can speak. You can set up sessions with one teacher that speaks to the students, but doesn't have to listen to all the crappy comments and questions. So we can have one-way conferences, we can have two-way conferences, we can have wait for leader and many other things. But mixing all those audio channels also takes a lot of processing power, and you need to consider that. 
some things you don't want to do on your PBA. And this is really important because running audio is really real time. If you publish video streams on your server or web pages, that's not really real time. We can send it with best effort. But if we suddenly start dropping packets in a telephone call, we're actually store it for a while. But we're busy. We're going to store this audio package coming in here for a while and then ship it out later. People won't like it. Okay. So Asterisk really needs control over your CPU, especially if you use hardware interfaces to connect to PSTN. Then it becomes very, very critical that we have the interrupts we need. So on your PBX, do not install X Windows especially if you're using KDE or GNOME, which have a lot of processors, each a lot of power, that will affect the quality of your call. You can do this, I mean, I'm running Asterisk on my laptop over here, and I have one simultaneous call. You know, I'm a male, I can't do multiplexing and many things at the same time. So one simultaneous call is enough for me. But if you're setting up a production server, don't use X Windows. If you see a happy penguin or chameleon or any other animal when you fire up your Linux, then your Linux is installed with something called frame buffers. It will also affect calls because it needs interrupts and other things. Also, for a lot of reasons, check your BIOS and your Linux installation in the Linux kernel if you're setting up a real production server. Disable everything you do not use. There's no use of a USB, disable it. Serial port, printer port, remove it. Everything that can cause interrupts. Both for removing interrupts, but also for security reasons. <coughs> Asterisk relies on a lot of different libraries uh, in order to compile. Some of them are required. Some of them will add features to your Asterisk installation. Bison used to be required, but it's not in the latest release, so this slide needs to be updated. Uh, we now have pre-processed all the parser files for you, so it's ready for compilation. We do need OpenSSL in the current release for uh, its encryption and some other features. Termcat, Encursus Devil, and Sedlib is also. Sorry? It, yeah, I said in the release version. In the trying, we'll have a lot of new exciting features for you coming up in the development version of Asterisk, where we remove some of these bindings. Uh, but that's future stuff. Optional module. Asterisk will recognize whether or not you have these installed at compilation time. We're not supporting today auto configuration with configure like many other software do, but we do recognize and check for certain installations in the make file. MPEG-123 is something we can optionally use for music on hold. We have many other ways of running music on hold today. Libmute is required by some, for some third-party applications, mainly if you buy Vigium hardware and uh, want to test uh, connectivity and see accuracy and other things. Voicemail by email seems to be a very sexy feature. When I install Asterisk in a new customer site and I enable voicemail and they get audio files in the email, it's like, wow, I got to show the, the boss. Oh, the manager, my wife, someone. It's really cool. And in order to be able to send mail, we need something that sends mail. Send mail or postfix or any mailer of your preference. If you have libcurl installed, we will add additional applications for you. And there's a number of other uh, third-party applications that we recognize. Some databases will add database support to your asterisk, like MySQL. Uh, and there are other things as well. There are many different kinds of Linuxes out there. Uh, some Distributions call themselves enterprise or professional or carrier, and some are more personal. One big difference in regards to Asterisk is the number of file descriptors we have available for Asterisk. 
You have to remember that the file descriptor is used for socket communication as well. It's not only for reading files on your hard disk drive. And for instance, if you're happy enough, go to sleep, to use SIP, the wonderful protocol, we're going to have five ports open per core. So we need five file descriptors per core. And if you have 100 calls, you need 500 file descriptors. In addition to that, Azure uses internally file descriptors for logging, reading stuff, doing stuff during the call. So you need to change the number of available file descriptors. I already mentioned that. We used to have Azure previously uh, in CVS. For the latest version, version 1.2, we moved to Subversion as our primary tool to maintain source code for developers. And in the Subversion repository, we have something that is really working tool. If you download from Subversion, there's no guarantee that you will get any audio or video through your Linux system. There's no guarantee of anything else that will fill your hard disk with a lot of code and sound files and other crazy stuff that may or may not compile or do something funny for you. But we have a release version. The release version is available from our FTP server. It's in a tarball. You download the tarball, unpack it, and compile it as normal. If you want to live on the bleeding edge, we do invite you to download from Subversion. You'll find instructions on asterisk.org. We have a lot of new features going on in the, for the next release, version 1.4. And we do want people to test it. This is our release structure, really. A bit old slide now, because we have released one, two. In the old days, more than a year ago, one and a half year ago, we only had one branch of CVS. And when people ask, what, what version can I install on my production server? People get answers like, you know, February 22 was a good version, but there were a couple of cool features added, March 5, but they were broken March 10, so probably March 6 or March 7 could be a good choice. Well, we couldn't live like that. So, Mark here released at our first Asterisk conference, Astrocon, Asterisk 1.0, and that was subsequently patched, so we got 101, 102, 103. Last year, in November, we released Asterisk 1.2, and we're, we're now up to version 1.2.4 for Asterisk release version, which is the version we recommend you use for production. The release cycle today is a bit more, I would say, well planned, and hopefully we'll be able to succeed with that. You have to remember that we just learned how to maintain two versions of the source code. So we successfully have policies and procedures in place to maintain a release version where we're not adding features. And we have a hero that maintains the release version called Russell Bryant, a student that really, really takes care of this. Imagine other programmers play around, create sexy tools, become heroes, do cool stuff, and he's sitting there saying, no, no, no. Oh yes, that's a bug fix, I'll implement that. Nope, nope, nope. And he loves it. <laughs> that's a hero to me. And we tried to release him for that after one, two, saying, okay, you've done this now, please. But he wanted to stay. So we need all kinds of people uh, in an open source project. And maintainers of stable releases, testers and developers, they all need to work together. But what we're doing now is actually implementing a release cycle where we say that we will release a new release version every six months. And in the plan, we have a set date for major architecture changes, a set date for code freeze and beta testing, release candidate testing. So hopefully you'll see asterisk one four during the summer sometime. But you never know, it's the first time. So, tonight, you go home and you realize that, well, there's, there's only sports and boring stuff on TV. 
Fire up your Linux system, make sure it connects to the internet, download after it. Uncharge the tar file, and you know this. Run make, make install. The next step is make samples, and we will remind you of that. Make samples to install a sa sample configuration. It's not a simple configuration. It's a lot of options in those files. But it's a reference installation where you can connect your phone and place a few calls. You'll actually be surprised because when you call extension 1000 without talking on your connected phone, you'll get a menu. You get Ask Allison talking to you. And one of the options is placing a test call to DKIM officers in Huntsville, Alabama. And it's quite funny listening to people who call in there saying, hey, someone is speaking in my, hello, hello, can you hear me? Oh, it's a true person, hello. And it keeps happening. Because after installation, they just work and they connect over internet and place a real phone call to USA. That's after. So, let's go into a bit more detail. Directory. The main configuration file of Asterisk is called asterisk.com. It's by default on Linux, installed in etc. Asterisk. And this is read at boot time for Asterisk to find out where we have all the optional files we need. Where do we have separate modules to load? Where do we have the collection of sound files that is attached to the distribution? All those cool Alison prompts in American English. And yes, there are distributions of other languages out there. I read the other day in the mailing list that someone made French files now as well. Some of them are professionally recorded files, like Alison files. Some of them is the wife with a bad microphone in the kitchen with the kids in the background. <laughs> and you don't want to use those in a professional environment. But there's still sound files, sound prompts in various languages. <coughs> and of course, you're here at FOSFAM, so you're Linux professionals. You know what a background daemon is. Asterisk executes as a daemon. Some people are very surprised by that because they enter asterisk in the command line and nothing happens. They get a new problem, it's like, who, what happened? Hello, where did asterisk go? But that's perfectly all right. We execute in the background. To connect to your background daemon, you run asterisk-r, or actually r asterisk if you want to do it another way. And if you do that, it will be exciting times for you. It will be really, really cool times because you'll see our professional graphical user interface, the command line. Hey, no point and click here. Traditional, true, spirit, command line. Enter text, enter. Command completion, history, everything you need. Really cool. In the command line interface, you can get logging on what happens when people place calls. You can show what's going on in your asterisk, what calls you have, various configuration options, change some internal settings. However, when asterisk start, starts in the background, things may happen that prevents asterisk from starting. So you start asterisk, you get the Linux prompt back, you start your phone, and the phone says, no server. Hello, what do you want me to do? But and you don't know what happened. You need to force asterisk in the, to stay in the foreground and tell you what's going on. And you do that by starting with asterisk-t. If you add a couple of Bs for verbosity and a couple of Ds for debug, you'll get a lot of information that will make you happy because you're an Linux hack hacker. You'll get debug messages saying you crazy stuff like, ouch, that hurt it, or things like that. But you will actually be able to find out what module that didn't load, and probably why it didn't load on your machine, and try to fix that and start again. So we have, in the true Linux, uh, I would say religion, many different options, where lowercase and uppercase is a difference. We actually have a man page now, where you can read about all the various kinds of options. If you want to run asterisk in a sandbox with different usernames and groups, you can do that. 
A very important option is dash x. If you run after it, dash r x, and then a CLI command, after it will execute that CLI command in a console and then exit. So if you want to create a web interface that updates the list of zip phones that are attached or shows the channels or you want to do something else from a web script on your web server, you can do that. But after it starts at dash rx, it's a very handy way of connecting from other applications to after it and checking what's going on or changing some properties. Like MySQL, we have a script in the distribution called Safe Asterisk. They have Safe, safe MySQL that starts Asterisk, sets some options, and checks the running daemon. If something happens, the script may optionally mail you saying, I restarted, but it will restart Asterisk if something happens. If you run into the development version, you can be assured that something will happen, and it will make you happy to help us debugging the error and finding and fixing the bug. So safe asterisk is a good script to use on a production server. We also do our best to support the disk manufacturers by adding a lot of logging. We can log to syslog, but we can also log to ordinary text files on your hard disk drive. So do everything we can to fill it. You can log various kinds of messages. And as we develop asterisk, we actually, for each message we print, we sort it up in a category so you can choose what you want to see and where you want to have logging. If you want logging to go to the console or this kind of messages to go to syslog. In a production server, you, uh, in a Linux Unix installation, you may, might want the errors to go to syslog because that's how you handle errors in all your Linux Unix systems. But warnings, notices, debug messages, you might take the file. If the server is up and running and it works fine, you might want to remove the debug messages. We also added DTMF logging. If you created creating uh, IDR scripts and you want to check your customers and maybe save logs or what they enter, you can do that now easily. <coughs> so you have Asterisk running on your server and you change the configuration file. In some cases, you can simply tell Asterisk to reload. That means reread all configuration files, live happily ever after, but stay alive. However, for some of the <coughs> configurations, we can't let you do that. Because if we have active objects, like zip phones that are active with us, we won't reconfigure them on the fly. And some hardware interfaces doesn't really let us do that on the fly, reconfigure the hardware binding. So you need to restart. This is, I wouldn't say, well documented, but we try to document this in each configuration file and try to help you in order to decide whether or not you want to reload or restart. You have to remember that restart actually drops all active calls. You can't tell Asterisk to wait until we have no calls or actually stop accepting new calls but wait until the current calls hang up, then restart in order not to affect the calls. But if you're playing a dangerous game, you can force Asterisk to restart now. And then Asterisk will just drop all the calls, restart, and make you happy, but your users will be, well, thanks God for GSM. They probably used to drop calls being dropped and things happening, so I don't know if they will react. Questions? It depends on the module, really. We have so many different modules. But for instance, in SIP, if a peer is registered with us, we will not reconfigure the peer. No, not, not of the peer. Not of the peer. Users will reconfigure, but not the active peer. Cleaning. We might change that. For some of the modules, we have special reload commands. 
let's say you reconfigured parts of the SIP channel, but you don't really want to change the rest or affect those models, then you can reload the SIP model. Uh, if you change the dial plan, you can run an extension to reload, which is a very clever command because a dial plan can be very huge and big and require a lot of parsing. And you don't want that parsing to affect your con concurrent function of the PBX. So you actually do all the parsing without changing the running PBX. And when we're done and we have a complete in-memory dial plan, we quickly shift them in memory and release the old one without affecting the core. So extension to reload is a good command to remember. And as Mark said earlier on, we actually, in our beautiful, wonderful Linux hacker adapted graphical user interface, we have a lot of documentation. We have show application and show application application. We have show function now in one, two. We have a new construct called functions that help you build a dial plan. Of course, we have help, but we also have documentation for all the API commands and all the manager commands. Any questions on that part? This was running in high board rate. Show function function name will show you a bit more, uh, but there's no document. We have a lot of information made by the community on the VoIP info wiki. There's also an O'Reilly book uh, with the name Asterisk the Future of Telephony. But the beautiful part with that is that it's written by members of the community. It's over there, rated. It's published on the, online under the Creative Commons license. You can download it all as PDF from asterisk.org. Okay. Let's move on to some of the core parts and take a brief look at asterisk configuration. Is that okay with you? Seems like I successfully killed them with PowerPoint, so I have no questions. But please, you can question at any time, no problem. Asterisk, like Mark said, is very much like a pack shell telephony. We have uh, many, many different modules, and there are many, many ways to use Asterisk. In uh, carrier environments, when te for telcos, we use Asterisk one way. In the home, for monitoring your kids, we use Asterisk one way. In PBX environments, in enterprise environments, where they order to have a PBX and we add asterisk to add functionality. Might, might want SIP, might want voicemail, meet me, we use asterisk one way. So you have many, many modules, channels, functions that you want to configure. But don't be afraid because you, when you start using asterisk, you won't have to touch all of those files. They're just there to scare you. So let's look at configuration files and try to divide them into several groups. As Mark said earlier, the PBX core is the module that really runs after it. handles all dial plan execution, very sensitive threading and processing of audio and all that. Uh, here we have, of course, the main configuration file, asterisk conf. But another important file if you want to install asterisk on gum sticks or very, very tiny servers, because in this part of the industry, it's really, really sexy to run on small systems. You hear grown men looking at something else saying, look, he's smaller than mine. Uh, that's weird. Modules.com is where you tell asterisk what to load and not to load. If you, for some really, really peculiar, strange reasons not want to run SIP, you can tell Asterisk to don't bother with loading chance SIP. I won't talk to you forevermore, but you can do that. But there are modules you might want to skip. If you don't want conferencing, unload the module if you have memory constraints or security constraints. The modules that handle the cool stuff, an incoming call or an outbound call, for a channel. For each technology 
we implement an asterisk to create a new channel driver. So we have SIP, we have SAP for all the PSN technology, MGCP, X2, Suite 3, and soon Gino. Those are channels. And for each protocol, a new, we have new signaling, we have new ways of defining the devices, the lines, the channels, the endpoints, whatever they call them. For each end channel driver, we need a configuration file. And those configure the basic stuff, if it's a void protocol, IP address, port number, some default setting, and then the various channels or devices we connect to the channel. We have applications and functions. Some of them are embedded in other parts, other modules, but a lot of them are actually their own modules that you load or unload as you wish. Smaller ones have no configuration, but the conference bridge, voicemail especially, and a few other ones have their own configuration files. For voicemail, you set up the language you want to use, the email template you want to use, time zone for various accounts, and then the voicemail boxes. So that's an important configuration file if you want asterisk or on voicemail. Codex. I'm very lucky that uh, Jean-Marc is in another session here because I frequently say that Codex is kind of standardized in a way so you don't need to configure it and they're very strange modules. Mark is half asleep, so he won't object here. But the speech protocol is the only one that is so complicated, so we need a configuration file. <laughs> and I'll discuss that with uh, the speech guy later on. But we have a configuration file, and I asked him yesterday in order to help me understand that file so I can teach people about it, because I don't understand it right now. Codex! Okay. Let's see. I have a slide of that. If you wait, Mark. I'll... He remembers everything. I need slide work. If you have the speech library installed, we will have it. We do handle those passed through, but we can't really handle them. Okay, uh, codex are used in the VoIP channel to handle real-time conversion of an analog audio sound to some digital media stream. <coughs> but format drivers are modules that actually take incoming multimedia and save it to a file on your hard disk drive in order to help that industry because some of the files can be pretty large if you monitor core, for instance especially if you monitor the calls of teenage daughters, that will fill your hard disk drive. Uh, this is also used to read prompts, like all the Amazon prompts that we include and play them out. What you want to do is have the file in a format that is very close to the code that you use. Otherwise, asterisk needs to translate all those files 
as we play them. And you can say the same prompts in multiple formats if you run multiple codecs in your asterisk. But there's no configuration file. We have two sets of modules that are called PBX or resource modules that implement a lot of the core features and asterisk and extend asterisk in various ways that are not really channel related but, or dial plan related but extend channel PBX core or dial plan applications. AGI, of course, is one of those and core parking, core uh, transfer and the whole configuration engine are all implemented as resource modules. And some of these have their own configuration files. <coughs> information wants to be free, Mark said. But there are people who believe that information wants to be built. There are people who have a telecom history where they want to charge for usage instead of availability. And uh, unluckily enough, we have to support that. But you also might want to log each call for traceability in order to see what happens in your PBX. Run statistics, for instance, with the web interface created by Reske here. Ray. He made an open source interface to the CDR record. We have various modules to satisfy these crazy people. Uh, we can, of course, by default, all the call data records as CSV, comma-separated text files, which should be the worldwide standard. It's easy to handle, it's standardized, and every Unix application can handle it. However, people want to store it in crazy databases, so we support a wide range of databases as well as ODBC. So there are many different drivers to store information about each call as it either fail or is hang up. And each of those have their own configuration file and we also have a generic configuration file for the CDR subsystem now in order to set some generic information like time zone data and other things. Uh, these configuration files mainly handle settings for logging into various database systems, pointing out database and table names and such. All configuration files are usually installed in a separate asterisk. If we're lucky enough to run FreeBSD, we will now install them from version 1.2.4, the next version, in user local, etc. as they should be. There's an additional open source project started by Mark and Jim Dixon called Fastel which is a separate project. So if you install FastTel drivers, which are the drivers for hardware interfaces sold by Digium, Digium uh, you need to check also the etc. SAFTEL conf configuration file. Remember that this is a separate project, open source project. So the configuration file is not within the asterisk directory. It's in the etc. Well, I have to warn you that, well, this is an open source project. Anything can happen. We have no, I, uh, we're getting better and better in handling things common way. We're implementing now parsers for handling application calls, trying to go for the same syntax in various parts of Asterisk. But for configuration files, we actually have two different kinds of syntaxes. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been around since Windows 3.11. Some of you. Remember the wonderful times of Win i9 and System i9. Those files look very much like the asterisk configuration file. You have a section name in square brackets, you have label equals value, label equals value. Fine, simple, can handle that. But in two of the configuration files, we actually have a sexy object-oriented style with inheritance. I think we can do a lot of marketing bullshit around that. Uh, where you actually set a few properties, then declare an object. Continue. But the next object you declare will inherit properties from the first one. You need to make sure when you read these files that you read them from top, then down to the bottom in order to see how you configure things. 
or you have to repeat all the configuration settings for each object. We can include configuration files and other from other files into one. So you can separate a big DAO plan and take out the incoming lines or the outbound lines in separate files and have after it uh, merge them for you. In one two, we can also handle templates, so you can repeat information. If you have a number of granting phones and a number of Cisco phones, you can have the settings for granting phones and Cisco phones in a template and then just apply the template to each phone you configure. We gone through, and I won't talk about billing. <coughs> That's boring. We have a few minutes for questions. Go on. I will repeat you. Uh, the, the question was, is there a limit on number of SIP users that can register with Asterisk? Well, yes and well, no. Depends on the system. On a gun stick, yes, there is. Uh, I don't know that we have any coding limits. Uh, the limits we have in Asterisk would be the number of messages you have in a mailbox and some other things. However, depending on your system, there might be a limit. There are people who use databases to store all the various phones they have, and they have like 10,000 accounts. And as phones register, we read from the database, we process the registration, save it in the database, and then forget everything about it. And by doing that, we can actually handle quite a large number of phones. And the limiting factor would be the sim number of simultaneous calls, not really registration, unless you have a real core database, because that will affect it. Yes. Uh, as I understand the question, you're talking about LDAP directory. Okay. Uh, the question was, can we store in LDAP? Yes. Uh, soon. We have an internal architecture called the Asterisk real-time architecture. Uh, because in Asterisk 1.0, in the SIP channel, we have support for MySQL for storing objects. In voicemail, we have Postgres. And we have various kind of patches everywhere flying around. Looking at that and all those patches for MySQL, your SQL, PostSQL, PreSQL, I looked into the source code and said, I will never be able to ma maintain the SIP channel because I don't want to learn all these interfaces. And the other programmers said the same. So we created an internal architecture where we have storage drivers. We're not calling them database drivers. They're storage drivers. And in the bug tracker, there is a patch for a real-time LDAP driver that will make it possible for you to store all objects, voicemail accounts, call queue accounts, SIP accounts, everything in LDAP. Please test that. I need your input. I really need it. Yes. Yep. Please check that and see if it works together with Sear LDAP. It's highly configurable, but I haven't been able to test it. But the whole idea with real time was not to be a database abstraction layer, but a storage abstraction layer, so we could support LDAP and other things. Yep. Stealing ideas is a good thing. Okay, more questions. Support. Are there any plans to support encrypted connections? Well, as Mark said, our roadmap really depends on developers and users that pay developers to do things. We have encryption in the X2 protocol, and don't quote me for saying this because I'm, I'm the SIP programmer here. In the X2 protocol, we have RSA authentication. A very, very strong authentication me method used between Asterisk servers for setting up trust. And this is a very important feature. From version 1.2 of Asterisk, we also have encryption. 
uh, for this protocol. The SIP protocol, however, in order to have encryption, needs TLS set up, and we haven't got TCP, we're on UDP only. In order to get TCP working, we really need to rewrite some of the basic socket abstraction and some of the signaling, because a lot of things doesn't apply on, a t I would say, a TCP transmission layer. So hopefully we can have that by the end of the year. There is a strange patch in the bug tracker for encrypted audio, SRTP. However, the key exchange is made in the full open uh, in the SIP protocol. And it works with Snow phones and some other phones. It's a good start. We have a, a patch, but that's a, an experimental patch for TCP support in the bug tracker. A lot of stuff in the bug tracker. However, that patch really doesn't scale and do everything right. So it's very, very, very basic. Yes, we can open a TCP socket and listen to incoming connection, but there's a lot of things we do wrong in there. Yes? How does a basic rate of space card support Basic rate of space card support. Uh, I would have to start answering that because he's an American. For Europe, yes, you can buy extremely cheap HFC-based cards. Uh, I bought them for 300 kronas, which translates to something like 35 euros. Yeah, okay. So th they're cheap for one line. There's also manufacturers that have four-line cards, uh, Beronet and uh, Junghansnet. I uh, just got the Baronet one for testing, I haven't tested those, and they're octo cards for BRI. Uh, we have a new channel in Asterisk called Chan MICN, which supports the, I would say, successor to ICN for Linux, MICN. <coughs> and a lot of cards are support MICN today. We also have a patch which is not included in Asterisk distribution, but made by Carl Peter Junghans called BRI stuff that adds to the SAP channel support for HFC-based cards. And I've been using these in production in many places. I actually have one PC with four cards running. It required special motherboard in order to handle all those interrupts. But it's been up and running for a year without a problem. So it's HFC cards yep. and this patch has four yep. MISM? Four MISM, which is included in Asterisk today. Stockholm, Sweden, so I'm in Europe. <laughs> I hope. Even though we haven't got the Euro. A, a cool feature with those drivers is that we support NC mode as well. So if you have an ICM PBX or an ICM phone, you can connect this asterisk as a phone, and you can connect asterisk as a DC. That's what I do at home, yeah. And I take in eight phone numbers, eight MSN, and one single BRI. So it's cool. Uh, th there's an old channel called Chan Kasi as well, if you want to run Kasi. Uh, the cool thing with that, I think Fritz LM cards have drivers for that is that you, on the same server you can have Hylafax taking faxes on some MSN and Asterisk taking the rest. Uh, I don't know if it's maintained anymore. It is. Okay, cool. Uh, was the minimum set up for DC setup or only uh, 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 Depends on the patience you have for uh, compilation. Okay, uh, one, one of the, my fellow Asterisk programmers uh, installed one of my patches for testing on a Pentium 133. I said, oh, I'm downloading now. And after a while I asked him, okay, did it work? Hey, I'm still compiling. <laughs> and he compiled for an hour or two, but dial from the command line and play it for over the sound card. So. You had a question? Thank you. 
configure asterisks, and if, have, if they're on the same box for the MC, you configure asterisks to only answer sum n and sum n and disregard the rest of the call. So that's how I did it with uh, high loss acts and other things. And I still have the MC bit taking some phone numbers. So I know that that works with chain copy. I believe it works with clear eyes up and MRCM as well. I wouldn't be surprised if it didn't work. Yes? On the Open BC, uh, that's a good question. I haven't run on Open BC, but on FreeBSC, I actually did most of my asterisk development on FreeBSC, and the only I would say thing that doesn't work is the SATL drivers because they're kernel level drivers. However, there is a project that created SAT cell drivers for FreeBSC, so we can get the timing we need for some applications. But I, I run production servers on FreeBSC with VoIP only, and it works brilliant. And we, in, in uh, the source code, we actually support NetBSC, FreeBSC, OpenBSC, and OS X. Let's discuss that offline or report bugs within the bug tracker. 729 for FreeBSD, I believe it's available. We have 729 for FreeBSD, OS 10, and Linux. Sorry? Uh, I think they're $10 a channel or that's a license fee to the patent holder. So, digium.com have a mail order software. How about the participation tracker by full information and the full control to be Like, you have some sort of division. Do you need to give me an individual or a What can you have a cool interface? Yeah. We have a cool interface called the Asterisk Manager interface. There's AMI already today, which is a TCP IP interface, and then there's also SNMP in the bug tracker. That's one of the ones being upgraded. Uh, we don't have it within Asterisk. Uh, the, the current plan is actually to use something we call the manager proxy. The manager proxy will be able to implement all of those features, XML parsing and other things. Uh, because currently we, we, we have chosen not to implement XML within the core PBX because XML parsing can be tedious and it can be a reason to down denial of service attack. Mm -hmm. uh, but the manager proxy is where we try to implement uh, various kinds of uh, CTI interfaces that exist in the industry as well as being the layer you use for SOAP and so. There are Java interfaces, SOAP interfaces, a lot of different interfaces. There are many, many projects surrounding our, our main core project. So if you go to the VoIP info wiki and search for them, you might find something. Yeah. But currently we have a kind of raw and unstructured manager interface. And we'll probably keep working on the raw and unstructured interface and structure it a bit more so you can easily use the manager proxy to translate that into various XML calls and support SOAP, XML RPC, or whatever flavor you want. Yes? There's not official support built in uh, for a speech track engine yet, but we're working on doing it. Um, you can use Festival already, and there's Res Textual, which is uh, officially going to be available soon. It's sort of unofficially available right now, but uh, you'll officially be able to get it. But Res Textual is obviously based on the Textual uh, text to speech.
case, this is a proprietary package. So your options are fairly limited in the pure open source sense just because there's, there's not a lot of really good text-to-speech festivals about as good as it gets, and it's very CPU intensive and not uh, especially scalable. And you've got Sphinx 2 on the, on the speech rec side. Um, that's, uh, but we haven't seen real official uh, integration with it. Don't know. That, that question's been raised, but there's also um, uh, voice XML, which might be a more logical route to go initially. But I guess that's really to be decided still. Uh, what we have in Aster is oh, one, two. Bad sound. We need speech here. Uh, it is an interface called external IVR which can be used to connect to your application over a Unix pipe, and your application would control the whole IVR prompts and everything. So you can produce prompts in real time, store it uh, available for asterisk, and tell asterisk to play it. Uh, that's been used to create kind of live auctions on the phone, where you can't really script it because you don't know what's happening and when, so you need to control it from an external application. So that's a very good user interface to create your own integration to various kind of engines, voice XML and other things. I've seen people use that for voice XML. And we have a few patches that we included in the SIP channel in order to be able to send the URLs you need for that kind of stuff. Asterisk is already the killer, yes. Okay, how do we keep track of the user location? What's that? Uh, features. Okay, if you want call forwarding or follow me. That's all stuff you create yourself in the dial plan. Uh, we have, we have, or from the phone, but it's so different in various parts of the world on how you want to do it in various companies. But because the dial plan is highly scriptable, you create do not disturb, follow me, call forwarding functions. On some phones, VoIP phones, especially the SIP phones, the phone wants to be king. And you probably have a button there for call forwarding and enable that in the phone. And by doing that, Asterisk will place the call first to the phone and get a forwarding instruction from the phone and follow that to the next point. So it can be done in many ways. Sorry? Can you activate the call forwarding from the phone? Yes. Uh, that's one of the labs we have in the Asterisk training classes I'm holding. But it's normally done, uh, if you want to do it in a multi-protocol Asterisk way, you do it in the dial plan by adding an extension. Since we then I would add star 21 star phone number hash and take that as a call forwarding instruction. But in other parts of the world, you might have other vertical service code for implementing that. But it all depends on the phone and how you want to do it in your environment. Again? The redundancy aspect, yes. If you want redundancy, you want asterisk to be in control and store it in a way so you can reach it from many different servers instead of doing it on the phone. Okay, we have to close it up. We'll be around for questions on the floor here. Thank you very much.